ti hei bauri ora koro hi po koro hi ao koro ora i tūri e te matahau o tū tū te wini wini tū te wana wana tū a fio fio tū ranga a te o tāwhiri mā te mahi ni tāna mahi o hane te dā rā koutou, te dā koutou, te dā koutou e ka langa tira e mihi atu tēnei ki a koutou ki a taumai ngā mā nākitanga o te runga rā wa ki runga i a tātou katoa no reina ki a ora hui hui ano tātou katoa Ngā mihi ki a koutou katoa. I'm Stuart Lang, a historian, and I'm going to take us through some of the history of Christianity in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's a fascinating story, and one that deserves to be much better known by all New Zealanders, both Christian and not Christian, both Māori and not Māori. So here we go. E tō mātou mātua te rangi, whakapaenga tō ngoa. The story of Christianity in New Zealand and some very significant beginnings for our whole New Zealand society starts right here at Oihi in the northeast corner of the Bay of Islands. But to set the scene further, let's go back to the indigenous people of this country, the Māori. Māori came to Aotearoa a long time before this migrating from eastern Polynesia. They were a sophisticated tribal community living in small villages or kainga. They were led by rangatira, or chiefs, men and women elders, kaumatua, kuia. They were highly skilled seamen. They were highly skilled in fishing and cultivation and practical arts and also war. A Māori worldview incorporated a sophisticated and poetic sense of the sacred, or tapu, with beliefs in multiple gods or spirits. And it's into this context that the Christian gospel first came to Aotearoa. Imagine we're here in 1814. Up there on the top of that hill was the fortified village of the local Ngāti Torehina people. The local people called this place Hōhi. And it was right here, on the 25th of December, 1814, that the Christian message was first preached on New Zealand soil. The preacher was Samuel Marsden. The site for the service had been carefully chosen and prepared by the local chief, Ruatara. But Ruatara had done far more than just choose the site. He'd fenced off about half an acre of land and overturned some old waka as seating and put up a makeshift pulpit and covered it with black cloth. He made sure everything was ready. The service began with the singing of Psalm 100. Marsden then preached from the text, Behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people. He then no doubt went on to the words, For to you is born this day a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. At the service, there was a large crowd of about 400 Māori present, including leading Ngāpui chiefs Korokoru and Hongi Hika. Korokoru and his people had come over from the other side of the Bay of Islands, and Hongi Hika and his people had paddled out from the Kerikeri area. And of course, Ruatara and the local Ngāti Torahina people had come down from the village on the hill. There were also about 25 Pākehā present, including the three missionary families, the Halls, the Kendalls and the Kings, and the crew of the Brig Acta, which was anchored out in the bay. Marsden had sailed into the bay six days earlier, bringing with him Ruatara and Korokoro, Hongi Hika and Hongi San, They'd all been staying with him in Australia. Before they left Sydney to sail back to New Zealand, some of the Māori chiefs had been given British regimental uniforms by the Governor of New South Wales. As the picture shows, they were wearing them at the service on 25th of December. Another indication of Ruatara's eagerness to welcome Marsden was that on the morning of the church service, Ruatara had erected from the highest point in the park the British flag. I think maybe the artist had overdone the size of the flag. 
It's usually been assumed that Marsden just preached in English. However, Marsden had been learning Māori language for some years from Ruatara and no doubt from other Māori who'd stayed with him in, in Sydney. And so it's highly possible that Marsden had preached at least in part in the Māori language. Marsden recorded in his journal that during his sermon some Māori said they couldn't understand him and that after he'd finished Ruatara had interpreted what he'd said. If in fact Marsden spoke in part in Māori, that would also have meant that Ruatara explained what Marsden had been saying as well as just translated it. Ruatara would have taken the opportunity also to say some other things appropriate to this very important occasion. When the service was completed, there was an exuberant Māori haka, the Ngāpui Dance of Joy, to Hare o Ngāpui. Here's a modern version of that same haka. Within the receiving of the gospel here, the good news, they were prepared in, to, to make space in their world, in their communities, in their lives, in their hearts, for the gospel to find a place, a new place uh, in the way that the pipi whararua, the shining kaku, comes from somewhere else, but finds a new place uh, for its young. Later in the day, Marsden wrote in his diary, in this manner, the gospel has been introduced into New Zealand. And I fervently pray that the glory of it may never depart from its inhabitants till time shall be no more. Christians see the wider background to the events of Christmas Day 1814 as uh, God's love being poured out to all peoples and that it is God's intention that the good news of Christ be proclaimed to the four corners of the world, including Oihi Aotearoa. The gospel coming to Aotearoa enabled us to discover how loved we are by God. The notion that any individual person could have a direct and personal relationship with God was uh, totally new. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. He had the word of God, the Bible, mm. and he preached the good news, the gospel to my people. The gospel is to all people that included me about him. The coming of the gospel to Aotearoa, in terms of the written um, accounts of the birth, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, that is absolutely life-giving. I believe that the message of the gospel is ultimately love. And that love is so powerful that it's not only for Māori, it's not only for Pākehā, but it crosses all races, it crosses all cultures, it crosses genders, it crosses generations. The power of the gospel is for everyone. I'm glad the gospel came to New Zealand because it sets us free. Um, it touches lives and it changes people. Without the gospel coming, we would never know how loved we are. Quite a backstory to these events of Christmas Day 1814. For instance, how did Marsden and Ruatara already know each other? And why did Ruatara invite Marsden to come here? Samuel Marsden, the apostle to New Zealand, was a visionary and determined man. He's very much part of the evangelical stream within the Church of England, in the tradition of John Newton and the anti-slavery campaigner William Wilberforce. For Marsden, being an evangelical meant being committed to salvation through faith in Christ, to individual conversion, to the Bible, and to spreading the message of Christianity to all nations. The motivation of the missionaries in coming to New Zealand was very much an evangelical one. They wanted to share their faith, and particularly the personal experience of conversion, which was central to their own lives. Since 1794, Marsden had been a chaplain at the prison colony in Port Jackson, New South Wales. He was one of the pioneers of Australian settler Christianity, but his attempts to evangelise Aborigines were not successful. 
He was also the minister of this very early church, St. John's in Parramatta. However, Marsden's reputation as a minister of the Christian gospel was damaged by him also being a magistrate in the extremely tough context of a prison colony. He'd gained the nickname of the Flogging Parson. Marsden's also been criticised for believing that it was necessary to civilise Maori before they could be converted, by teaching them various practical trades and skills. By the way, Marsden never lived in New Zealand. He visited seven times, usually with a few years in between. The human background to Marsden coming here is that he'd got to know several Maori who had visited Sydney as ship's crew, and Marsden had been really impressed by them. Over the years, he had invited many of them to stay with his family on his farm at Parramatta. Many of them had also gone to church with him in Parramatta. Marsden decided it would be great if the Church Missionary Society would start a mission to New Zealand. So in 1807, he travelled back to England to persuade the Church Missionary Society to do so, and they agreed. On the way back to Australia, he discovered on board the ship a young Maori chief called Ruatara, who was very ill. Marsden nursed him back to health and befriended him. And Ruatara then lived with Marsden for eight months at Parramatta. Ruatara was fluent in English, and he taught Marsden some Māori. Marsden taught Ruatara about Christianity, but there's no evidence Ruatara ever became a Christian. As it happens, there are no portraits of Ruatara himself, but there is a painting of another young local chief, his relative Te Uri o Kanai. It's important to realise that here at Oihi and everywhere else in New Zealand, missionaries only ever establish mission stations at the invitation of local Māori. In this case, Ruatara had urged Marsden to site the first mission settlement in New Zealand directly adjacent to his own pa at Rangihaua. It is an historical fact that Marsden had endeared himself to Ruatara, Hongi, Korokoro, Waikato and others whilst they were at Parramatta in Australia. And particularly when you look at that uh, bonding with, uh, among them, it would indicate that they held Marsden in uh, quite high esteem, particularly Hongi Hika, who uh, chose his friends very carefully. Clearly Ruatara had his own reasons for welcoming the missionaries. Hosting the first permanent European settlement in New Zealand would give Ruatara mana, and maybe as well, privileged access to European goods and technologies and animals and crops. Tragically, within four days of Marsden leaving for Sydney, Ruatara died of a fever. Oihi is historically important for New Zealand because here were some quite substantial first beginnings for New Zealand society, in particular the Māori and Pākehā bicultural society. Adjacent to each other, the missionary settlement of Pākehā and up here the Ngāti Torehina Pā and the two interacting with each other quite positively. And there were quite a number of important firsts that took place here at Oihi. For instance, this is where the first European-style houses were built in New Zealand, and the building platforms are still clearly evident. This is where there was the first Pākehā-style school. Then there was the first pastoral farm. Māori had always cultivated the land for crops such as kumara, yam and taro. But this is where there was the first farm in New Zealand with a flock of sheep and a handful of cattle. This is also where a number of European crops and animals first became part of Māori life. For instance, this is where Marsden brought the first horse to New Zealand. The horse was pushed off the back of the active and swum ashore, and local people were fascinated to see Marsden ride this horse up and down the beach. The first formal land sale took place here. And this is where the first Pākehā child was born, early in 1815. More importantly, this is where Pākehā first intensively studied Māori language and culture, and most important of all, this is where the Māori language was first committed to writing, through the work of Thomas Kendall, and this was an essential precursor to the development later of a Māori Bible. For all those reasons, Oihi deserves wider recognition by all New Zealanders. A good case can be made for seeing Oihi as one of the key birthplaces of New Zealand society.
Life here at the Oihi was far from straightforward for the new community. They found their situation here in New Zealand extremely testing, physically, emotionally and spiritually. There was cultural shock, there was constant danger, there was strife among the missionaries, there was never enough food. It was very discouraging. It was four long years until Marsden was even able to visit again. After some years, the missionary Thomas Kendall lost his way, both theologically and morally, sold muskets, took the daughter of a Maori chief as his mistress. For many years, the New Zealand mission saw no Maori conversions. The season for that was yet to come. The situation scarcely improved in 1819, when an additional mission station was established at Kirikiri. The Kirikiri mission was under the shadow of Hongihika's Koralipo Pa, which he used as his departure point for many bloodthirsty expeditions of conquest during the 1820s musket wars. In 1822, a church missionary society internal report sadly concluded that the New Zealand mission was in confusion and fruitless. <laughs> 